So let's start with introducing our moderator, Dr. Leonard Winogora. Dr. Winogora is a professor of philosophy at Mercer County Community College. Uh, he focuses on teaching contemporary ethics and critical thinking. He received both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Chicago, covering subjects in history, philosophy, and politics. He is also the resident dean for the William Patterson uh, University Extension Program on the Mercer County Community College campus. Leonard has had an early interest in human, right, human rights issues and genocide, and first learned about the Armenian genocide from friends in the Armenian community. He has been a board member of our center for five years. Thank you, Dr. Winogora, for agreeing to serve as moderator tonight. I turn it over to you. And thank you, Professor Krasner. Uh, welcome to everybody. I think it's rather a great timing to have this meeting with the understanding that the President of the United States may change American policy which has cooperated with both the Armenians and the Turkish uh, government, the Republic of Turkey, and pretending it never really did happen, in spite of the very writings uh, during World War I of Ambassador Morgenthau, the United States ambassador, telling President Wilson exactly what was happening. So it is my pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Paul Bogosian, I'm trying to get the name right, though I understand I may not, I may have failed my Armenian class, but Dr. Bogosian is the silver chair at New York University, as well as the chair department. He holds numerous other positions in the community of philosophers, in direction, and um, his personal ambitions. But the most important thing that I focused on reaching out was his paper on the concept of genocide and the concept of denial. And he's going to present a rather in-depth program on this subject. Questions will be taken by your inputting them to the chat room. Um, let me now introduce Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for having this uh, important event. It is a documentary about the making of a feature film called The Promise. Uh, which is the first major feature film about the Armenian genocide that the Turkish government wasn't able to block. There were various previous attempts that got very far along, but in each case, um, such is the determination of the Turkish government for people not to learn about this episode, that they succeeded in blocking each and every attempt to educate people through a kind of motion picture that you would see for other reasons and in history. And I have to say, this is, it, it is remarkable just how successful the Turkish government has been in stamping out knowledge and uh, of this by the, the, by the, the global population. Uh, but part of this documentary that we didn't see, it's, it's about an hour and a half long, you know, it has various famous, uh, famous actors in it, like Christian Bale and Oscar Isaac, and, and even the director, whose name I'm now suppressing, who made the famous movie Hotel Rwanda, which was, of course, about the Rwandan genocide. The Irish director, it'll come to me soon. Um, and they all said, you know, prior to being asked to work on this film, they didn't know anything. They hadn't heard about the Armenian genocide. And this is you know, a hundred years after the fact, with it occasionally being in the news, especially as the centenary was approaching. So, you know, as campaigns go, as campaigns of denial go, you have to admit this was very, very successful. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not just the Armenians who suffer as a result of this successful campaign of denial. Uh, but as I say, uh, as you can tell from that quote of Hitler's, who gave it in, in the Ober Salzburg just prior to the invasion of Poland, by way of telling his generals, don't be afraid to be ruthless.
said, um, who now remembers the extermination of the Armenians? So don't worry about it. Even if uh, um, you, know, you run into problems, uh, nobody cares. And so this is the lesson that he drew. And some people think, maybe with, with some justification, that the Holocaust would never have happened, would never have happened in the magnitude with which it happened, had people been held accountable at the time, so that the lesson would have been, um, if you commit a crime against humanity of this magnitude, you will be held to account and you will pay the consequences. So it is extremely important, you know, people say, um, never again. Um, the only way to ensure never again is when you recognize what has happened and you apologize for it, and you make reparations for it, and you make restitution for it. Um, and, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the recent news that President Biden is going to acknowledge for the first time really in American history, um, I mean, as an official act of, of the sitting president, although of course there were, America knew about these events at the time, there were about 150 articles in the New York Times alone documenting the, the massacres, the deportations, the death marches, the suffering, the expropriation of property, and so on and so forth. So, and of course, the very famous cables by Ambassador Morgenthau that, that Leonard already mentioned to President Wilson detailing uh, what was going on and including his then short book called the, the Murder of a Nation, in which he documented all that he had seen. Um, so um, this is, uh, this is <laughs> something that the Armenian people have been campaigning for for a very long time. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing that it is finally going to happen, hopefully on Saturday. Though the New York Times said it's still possible that he may change his mind. I hope he does. Um, Paul, let me ask a question here. Some thoughts I've had. Um, as I said, I never heard a word about the Armenian genocide or any persecution out of Turkey from my education, both in the UK, France, and America. And then suddenly I have an Armenian friend in college and I learn a world I never heard about, a, a murder that never existed in any history book that I ever picked up. One thing I have to notice here is the persecution of the Armenian community. It didn't really start in 1915. I mean, when the M Ottoman Empire was created in 1299, it's like collapsed in 1923. All communities who were not members of the Islamic faith, that was Sunni Muslim, were considered second class citizens under the millet system, and they had to pay a special tax, the Demetis. But there was a peaceful coexistence that existed up until about the middle of the 19th century, and it allowed social and economic advancement for Armenians. There are many stories of success for Armenians um, for several centuries. What happened to break the social contract? Very good question. Of course, when we're talking about events of this magnitude, there is never a single cause, but a number of contributing factors. Uh, that came together to, to, to make for a perfect storm. So as you say, uh, of course, empires by definition are multicultural entities. So they, they, they cover um, um, a number of different races, ethnicities, religions, and so on. Though, as you point out, in every empire, of course, there is a kind of dominant ethnicity. And in the Ottoman case, it was the Turkish ethnicity that was dominant and everybody else had a second class status. Um, now, that, uh, the, the, the other component of this is that the, Ar the Armenians are a, have a very strong Christian identity. And of course, the Turks are, as you correctly point out, Sunni Muslims. Um, strong Christian identity in the sense that the Armenians were the first people to adopt Christianity as a state religion 10 years before um, the Holy Roman Empire is declared. 
And um, so you have a strong religious divergence here. You have a minority that is living in, 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 in these lands with you, but that has preceded you by 2,000 years. That's a very important part of this story. So the Armenians arrive on the Anatolian plateau in roughly 800 BC, about 1,900 years before the first Turks arrive in that area. Now imagine that, that's 2,000 years, that's as far from uh, 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 the, the Armenians arriving as we are now from, from uh, uh, the birth of Christ, let me say. Um, and in that time, they had, of course, built a, a, a major Christian civilization uh, with thousands of villages and towns, churches, schools, monasteries, uh, where, uh, by the way, the very first translations of Aristotle are into Armenian by these hardworking monks in these monasteries that must have been freezing cold. I don't know how they did all of that work. Uh, very beautiful settings, but, but very, very harsh conditions. And so that civilization is, uh, which eventually even has its own empire in the Middle Ages is subjugated by the, by, by the Turks, by the Ottoman Empire, and they, they learn to live as second-class citizens. But they are, as you say, always treated uh, in, in a harsh way, um, subject to special taxation. But despite all of that, they are discrepantly successful. So they, they accumulate wealth. They are very successful in um, intellectual endeavors and artistic endeavors and so on. So they also become the object of social envy. This is a very familiar pattern I'm sure people will recognize. Um, now, at the same time, so uh, one of the things that you're alluding to is that there were pogroms and massacres in the 19th century preceding 1915. There were several major incidents in which Armenians were massacred, sometimes to the tune of 20, 30, 40,000 people. In Adana, where my family comes from, in 1907, there was a very, very large massacre of Armenians. Some of it is prompted by, of course, as um, people are getting in increasingly irate at being treated in this second class way and subject to special taxation, there are movements afoot for greater autonomy and greater independence. Uh, this is the period, of course, at which these empires are beginning to crumble. So there's anxiety at many different levels. Um, you know, the um, Uh, already in the fringes of the Ottoman Empire, there are revolts where, um, in the Balkans, for instance, where people want to get rid of the yoke of the Ottoman regime, and they are successful in pushing out a million Turkish refugees who come pouring out of the Balkans and into Anatolia. So when you look at this overall framework, what you're seeing is there is a minority that is Christian that has been there for longer than you have been and has maybe a greater claim to having this be its homeland than you have. You seeing that you're going to have to create an ethno-national state out of the remnants of this empire, which is crumbling from the periphery and closing in on the Anatolian plateau. You have millions of Muslim refugees coming in from these peripheral territories with nowhere to, to be housed. So you're getting a kind of perfect storm of factors leading the central government to think, look, if we could only get rid of this two million strong Armenian minority, 
we would solve a lot of different problems at the same time. We would be able to create an ethnically homogeneous, religiously homogeneous ethno-national state out of the remnants of this empire. We would be able to confiscate all of their property and house all of these Muslim refugees who would come pouring in from the outer parts. Uh, and it, it, it sounds like a very a good solution to a very big problem. Fueled, of course, by the racial hatred that was there all along, the religious hatred that was there all along. And the fact that you're doing this under cover of the first of a world war, so that it's very difficult, even for people who know about this, all the powers knew, Germany knew, America knew, uh, the United Kingdom knew, to do anything about it because, of course, you're under wartime conditions. So I think, you know, those are all the different factors that explain why suddenly in 1915 it strikes this so-called young Turk government as a very expedient solution to a number of problems that we were facing. Okay, Paul, let me follow up on that for a minute. Um, I mean, we've, in history, and I'm an intellectual historian, we see the rise of nationalism and militarism through the latter half of the 19th century, going right up in the culmination of World War I. Now, a lot of historians do believe that's significant. Can you discuss with our audience today how those ideologies impacted the relationship of the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire as we approach World War I? Sorry, so you're, uh, you're, the, the, rise of, the rise of nationalistic... Yes, and, and the militarism that accompanied it. Yes, well, you know, the, the, I mean, this is related to the point that I was now making, of course. And, you know, there, there is a campaign that precedes 1915, which was called the Turkification campaign. It's even prior to the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire. Already there is a big impulse to make the Turkish identity the dominant identity in this part of the world. And um, this goes not just to um, um, the kinds of things that we already talked about, the, the, the taxation and the, and the second class treatment, but all the way down to replacing Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian names with Turkish names. It's trying to completely rebrand uh, the, 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 the Anatolian plateau, which everybody recognizes is going to be the core of uh, the ethno-national state that survive, um, uh, as, a, as a purely Turkish entity. Now, um, you know, the question um, why this occurs at that particular moment in time, I don't know, is a very deep question. Um, there, there are a bunch of things interwoven here. I mean, the, it's the chicken and egg situation. Are the empires crumbling because nationalism is on the rise? Or is it that nationalism uh, is, is on the rise because the empires are crumbling and so you've got to kind of rethink the identity of a state and of its borders and, and of who it contains and why it contains them. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but the two are clearly very closely linked. And of course, we've been living with the, the consequences of that to this day. Um, and you, know, you can see it play out even in recent American politics, this kind of uh, you know, resistance to demographic changes uh, in, the, in the body politic. You know, as you talk about that, and you mentioned the other peoples, and I think that's a factor I should bring up. I mean, we're focusing on the Turks being responsible for the persecution and the genocide. But just like the Holocaust, where we had other populations, including Polish and Ukrainians who joined the Germans in the extermination of the Jews, what about other populations, the Ottoman Empire, with a specific focus on the Kurds? Well, the Kurds, it's a very uh, important part of the story. Unfortunately, uh, the Kurds, of course, are a distinct Muslim minority within, within the Ottoman Empire, and now within modern-day Turkey. Um, 
though they and they but they have their own distinct identity and at the time um, Kurdish paramilitary groups not only were given license to um, attack molest confiscate uh, Armenians uh, even before the events of 1915 but they were then encouraged to attack the death, the poor people on their death marches uh, and kill or abduct uh, and confiscate property, steal and so on and so forth. Uh, so they played a very significant role, you know, as the regular Ottoman army was busy fighting uh, the allies, um, the Kurdish, uh, they were called Chetis, um, were very largely responsible for a great deal of Armenian suffering. But interestingly enough, the Kurdish people have officially apologized for their role in the Armenian genocide. That is something that uh, the Turkish government, of course, has not even come close to doing. You know, since I'm talking about internal, let's look at the um, central powers in World War I. Uh, and I must apologize, I was watching the video and I finally am looking at the comments and apparently you can't screen share Amazon. So I will write a protest note to Jeff Bezos at the end of this uh, meeting. But in the interim, you did hear about the trains. Germany was building the train lines to support armaments in that since the central powers were looking to seize aspects of the British empire in the Middle East, as well as nations have broke away the trains, shipping people. The Germans played a part in this. And the Germans, for them, the extermination of a population did not begin with the Jews in the 1930s. It actually began in Southwest Africa in the 1890s, in a country we now call Namibia, where an entire um, tribal group of people were exterminated in a very effective method in the first creation of concentration camps. And now we see the Germans, again, with very strong involvement in the Ottoman Empire, plus the building of trains, plus the shipping of people. It seems like we're looking at two events in world history that seem to give the outlines for how the Nazis would eventually proceed. And obviously, based on Hitler's comment, he knew a thing or two about it. Oh, yes. <laughs> it, th there was a very heavy German involvement, German presence in, in the Ottoman Empire. There was the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, as you were mentioning, funded by Deutsche Bank. Um, and then, of course, there was a very strong military alliance. And of course, in World War I, uh, Germany allies with Turkey. Um, and so there is a huge presence of mili German military officers, uh, training, uh, uh, often in charge of various districts of the military aspects of various districts. Um, and as I say, you know, they learned a thing or two about population control from the Ottoman, from the Ottoman experience. And they also unfortunately learned that you could do this, you could do this and actually get away with it. So these are two these are two terrible lessons, you know. One of them just about the logistics and practicalities of uh, marching to their deaths uh, over a million people. Incidentally, the, the trains, um, you know, I, I don't mean to make light of this, but I think the people who were on the trains you know, did not suffer as much as the people who were forced put their belong, whatever belongings they could on their backs and march for months through the desert, constantly being attacked by brigands and starving to death and without any security whatsoever. Um, so, um, but you're absolutely right. And this is, I think, one of the least studied aspects of this whole experience is the German complicity and the continuity between what happened in the Ottoman Empire, what the Germans learned from that, and what then subsequently happens in the Third Reich. And this is something that 
really needs to be to be looked at much more. You see, one of the problems, one of the aspects or consequences of Turkey's campaign of denial and the fact that um, um, you know they get so neuralgic whenever anybody claims that the Turkish Republic is founded on this crime against humanity is that it became very difficult for scholars to get involved in studying this as a piece of history because whenever anyone wanted to study this, they would immediately fall under the suspicion that they were either, you know, uh, supporting the Armenian line or supporting the Turkish line. So it became a highly politicized area of scholarship. I, I remember seeing this, the only people who would study this were Armenians in a very small number of so-called Armenian studies programs around universities. It was not studied as part of the First World War. Even to this day, I was talking to a colleague, a historian who was going to teach a course at NYU on the First World War. And I said, is the Armenian genocide going to feature as part of this? And she said, no. So you can, you can teach the First World War and never mention this <laughs> extraordinary thing, which is the complete elimination of a 3,000 year old civilization from a given region in, the, in a matter of months, uh, and not mention it as part of the history that you were studying, not mention it as part of what Germany was doing, not mention it as part of what Turkey was doing, not mention it as part of what was going on in the wars with Russia. I mean, it's, it's insane, but it's, it's, it was the politicization of this that um, deprived people the, the, the freedom with which to study this uh, so that we can all benefit from understanding how these things happen, what the patterns are, and how to prevent them in the future. You know, it's interesting when we say what people do not discuss. I remember doing review once of some American history books. Like until 1969, there was literally no reference to the African American community, except of course, Lincoln abolishing slavery and that. Um, the first book was Before the Mayflower, which first established the history. And, hello. And um, beyond that history, what we see next is the fact that then, and we still see this in American history, the role of the Native Americans, our indigenous tribal groups, the roles of uh, Hispanic Americans, we see denial. And so that brings up this very detailed point, denial. And I'd, I'm not going to say that, you know, well, Turkey's in denial. That's absolutely true. But isn't this apparent when we look across the globe um, there is still no reference. If I've been an example, People's Republic of China, they don't talk about how many people died under Mao. They barely reference the Cultural Revolution. Um, Russia is notorious. Putin's had all the history books rewritten again. Um, it almost seems like there was no end to the Tsar. It just simply went from one royal family to him. We look at this in nations, and mm -hmm. America's is guilty its histories, what it hasn't talked about, what they don't even know. For a laugh, I remember coming here and some was from the War of 1812 and after America won it. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You lost it. They burned the Capitol the first time, we saw the second, um, White House, and you sued for peace and the Treaty of Perry. America gave up, <laughs> lost everything. Britain lost nothing. How did you think it was a win? Nations seem to have an attitude we don't admit to the mistakes we made. And I mean, I don't think that Turkey is a sole example of a nation in denial, but it does bring me to a concept of not just the denial, but they had a new aspect when you brought the Germans in. We're looking at some element of possible eugenics. I noticed when I watched the video, which hopefully people will see or the movie, racism, how Armenians were treated um, when the chap who's the lead in the movie comes to medical school, you have to sit in the back row. 
very reminiscent of the beginning of Nazi regime rules. When, I mean, we know there was religious discrimination. It was like the Sunni, they, the Sultan and that team ran it, but they never suppressed the church. Actually, they took it over, but they allowed the practice of religions, although they encouraged you to convert to Islam, but they didn't require the Greeks, the Jews, the Armenians. They were not required to do it. But now we're seeing something else. Now we're seeing something where we're a better people. And eugenics, of course, was starting by the late part of the 19th century in Europe, but it apparently in some fashion managed to come into, into the Ottoman Empire where the Turks no longer looked at themselves as uh, just different people with different faiths or a ruling class. They looked at themselves as superior people. I mean, we know that we can look at that Nazification, but this is pre-Nazi. Yeah, um, I don't know. Look, I think um, you can have racial I'm not sure somebody has not muted. Uh, please, you, someone has come into our system. You shouldn't be on view um, and you should be muted. Can you please mute your computer? Um, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting, there's so many interesting aspects to what you just raised. There are many, many different dimensions here. Um, let me start just with the question of, of denial and the motive for denial and the point that you made that um, many nations have this, have this problem of facing up to their past, especially when the past is a very hard one to face up to. Um, you know, in this respect, nations are very much like individual people. You know, we, we all have a tendency to repress or suppress things that make us feel bad about ourselves. Um, so it's very understandable that unless you are made to confront some hard facts about yourself, about what you've done, you might have a tendency to want to suppress them. Okay? And I think that, that, that that's a perfectly understandable uh, response. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the reason why in Germany there is just such an incredible um, recognition, determination not to obscure, you know, even laws passed that forbid denying that the Holocaust occurred, which in my view goes too far. I wouldn't be in favor of such laws, for instance, about the Armenian genocide. I think it's much more important for uh, people to be allowed to, to make the, the false claims and be proven wrong rather than have that suppressed by law. But the reason why is that the, Germany had no choice. Germany was a massive loser of the Second World War. They were occupied and they were made to confront. They were made to confront what had happened. And I don't know what would have happened if that hadn't been the case. I doubt very much that there would have been this level of recognition. By the way, it's interesting that uh, Germany uh, has recognized the Armenian genocide, uh, and of course the, the, the Holocaust, as we were just now saying, but not their own complicity in it, not their own involvement in it. There has never been any recognition of that. So now the question is, so there is that uh, as a motive, uh, and so you have to, as, as you did in the case of Germany, simply make people confront the, 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 the hard truths about their past. Um, and that's, of course, what we've been trying to do. And unfortunately, the, 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 the opposition has been so successful in, in stamping it out that we've had to fight for 105 years. And it's still the case that very few people know about this, um, though luckily not this particular group. The other thing that there is, there is a kind of just very slightly, I mean, a, a venal aspect to the denial, which I didn't know about until I spoke to somebody who happens to be an Armenian advisor to the former prime minister of Turkey, uh, Davut Oğlu, who had among his circle of advisors uh, an Armenian. And 
this person said, listen, they won't acknowledge it because they don't know what the price tag would be. Once you acknowledge <laughs> killing one and a half million people, confiscating all of their possessions and lands, erasing their presence in a land in which they had lived for 3,000 years. Um, and, you know, you, reparations would be in order. And they are deathly scared of just what the price tag would be for such an acknowledgement, which is, and since nobody is forcing them to admit it and everybody has found it much more expedient to get along with Turkey, which is a NATO ally and has important air bases and spy bases right on the border with the former Soviet Union, with Russia now, uh, with Iran in the neighborhood and so on. It's just much more convenient to, to, to do as Turkey says and, and not press their faces in uh, the, the hard facts of their own history. The problem is that you cannot be a healthy democracy if you are spending so much energy trying to suppress the truth. A democracy dies in darkness. Isn't that the motto of the Washington Post? Yes, that it is. is correct. And in fact, one of the reasons why it is still such a dysfunctional place, uh, I think, uh, is because there is no, there is no freedom no openness with which to confront obvious truths. And yet, and yet we can see a democracy as an example, Japan barely began to acknowledge its crimes against humanity, famous rape and injuring, their persecution and exploitation of China in the 1930s, their comfort women, Korean women, and now they're in full-fledged denial no matter how much evidence, so many, how many witnesses and how many people are alive, Japan says, oh, we never did those things. So, and they are considered by most aspects a democracy. And yet the government there is committed to pretending it never happened. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't think it's the, the, the denial is that blanket. Uh, there, there been, there's been lots of movement uh, in Japan uh, over the last uh, couple of, uh, several decades, I think. But you know, we're, I'm not sure that we can compare in magnitude what uh, mm. two cases. So, you know, I think the magnitude does does make a difference. I mean, you know, um, the current Republic of Turkey could not exist in its current form had it not been for the elimination of 2.1 million Armenians interwoven throughout the entire territory of the Republic. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it goes to the foundation. I think somebody in the, in the documentary was saying that. Taner Akcan, who, by the way, is one of the few Turkish historians who have written very, very powerfully about this. And a, a very brave man, <laughs> in my view. Um, you know, it's it, the foundation of the Republic of Turkey is based on this major crime against humanity, and that's a hard thing to admit. You know, one might think, maybe you think the same thing is true of the United States in a way, with the indigenous peoples, but, you know, again, it's, um, I mean, what happened, of course, to Native Americans is a terrible, is a terrible thing, but, um, it's not as though they really controlled this territory. Whereas in the Armenian case, um, you know, they, 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 they really would have been in the way, in a way in which uh, uh, isn't true of the Japanese case and may not be true of the American case. Well, Paul, I'm going to bring up some questions from our audience, but I have one item if you could tell us a little bit. Your own family survival going from, from the land to the Ottoman Empire and you ending up in New York City. Well, so, you know, it's a, it's a, classic, uh, it's a classic case. I'll, I'll tell you my mother's side, which I know better than my father's side. Um, my mother was four months old 
when they were, they were in Adana, which is in southern Turkey. And uh, they were um, uh, deported. They were for, uh, told that they had to leave. They were among the lucky ones who apparently had a carriage so that the, the trek through the desert was on an overstuffed uh, carriage drawn by horses. And um, my mother used to tell the story that uh, along the way, some, some family member said, listen, this baby is never going to. Excuse me is never going to make it uh, through this track through the desert. So why don't we just sort of pretend that she just slipped and fell in the, in the river and that's it. And of course, my grandmother refused. So I'm still, I'm here because that <laughs> didn't happen. Um, they went, they made it through the, the desert to Aleppo, um, or Syria, of course, now itself torn up and they somehow survived there for three years um, before they were allowed back because they were from a part of southern Turkey which was under French uh, governance after the war. And the French invited the Armenians who had been forced out to come back and some of them did. And they lasted there until 1921 when the massacres began again. And this time they left on an Italian boat and ended up in Haifa, British mandate Palestine. So uh, I was born uh, when Israel was uh, nine years old, um, uh, having made it there and somehow survived all of the different, it was you know, going from one, one fire to another, but, <laughs> um, but we, we, we made it, and then we finally all made it uh, to the promised land here in the United States. Um, Thank you. Now I'll have questions. The first question is from our, our director, as well as a professor herself of Holocaust studies, Barbara Kresner. Quote, I have one question in the chat for Paul. What do you see as the strongest similarities between the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust and or other genocides and widespread hate movements. How would you think we might enact our awareness of these common threads in an early warning system to prevent current and future hate campaigns? One clarification, that's not my question. It's from Mike Jackson. Oh, thank you very Advisory much. Commission. I just copied it for you. Oh, okay, it's, um, thank it's you. A very, it's a very good and very complicated question. Uh, a lot of... Uh, people have written illuminatingly about this. I mean, you can't see certain patterns. There are certain preconditions. You know, when if you're going to treat your neighbors in this kind of um, vicious way, you really have to prepare the ground for this because you don't typically interact with your neighbors in this way. So you have to start with dehumanizing them, somehow reducing them. Uh, to something lesser uh, than you. And the first warning signs of, uh, of a, po a potential genocidal campaign is to see the rhetoric of dehumanization take hold, you know? uh, less than fully human, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, not worthy in the eyes of God, an infidel, uh, and, and so on. And there are many different shapes, of course, and forms that this kind of dehumanization can take. Um, the other is, of course, uh, where um, you attract, in, in conjunction with this, uh, social envy, because people are envious that you're a minority that sort of uh, sticks together and somehow uh, is seen as um, taking a larger portion of the pie than you deserve. Uh, so, um, you know, the, 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 these 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 things are, are common to the, to the to the German case as well to the Holocaust as well. Um, you know, it's a very good and difficult question. What the tipping point is? It's interesting that both of them take place during world wars, right? Because that provides a kind of cover that prevents intervention. Um, 
from, from people who might otherwise be taking a more notice of what's going on. So, so there are those three elements, you know, dehumanization, social envy, and a cover of a large catastrophe going on around you. Uh, at least those three elements that are common. Okay, my next question is from Dr. Alison Dobrik, professor of education at William Patterson University and the director of the center at William Patterson. Her question is, thank you for this important perspective about why this critical event is often missing from the history curriculum. This is important for teacher educators and school leaders to address. Teachers plan lessons based on state standards and the 2020 New Jersey social studies standards include, analyze the motivations, causes and consequences of the genocides of Armenians, Ukrainians, Jews and the Holocaust. My question is, how can we teacher educators or school leaders encourage teachers to include the Armenian genocide in the curriculum given that it is now part of what they are supposed to teach? Um, you know, I don't know enough about the mechanics of how things get into textbooks and school curricula, but um, what I will tell you is that when you, when, you, when you understand what happened, when you understand how it, um, not only the magnitude of the event that occurred at the time, but the way it continues to shape political events to this day. I mean, just look at the amount of attention that the, the screaming headlines, Biden about to pronounce these atrocities as genocide for the first time. And it's causing you know, huge ripples. It's going to possibly affect you know, um, America's ability to use an air base in Turkey. It might affect NATO maneuvers. It might affect you know, one of the things that Erdogan did in discouraging recognition of the Armenian genocide was to use the Syrian conflict, which he had a great role in, in, in flaming. And then, you know, turn on or turn off the spigot of refugees into Europe as a way of um, intimidating Europe into doing what he wanted. So, you know, there are huge consequences for all of this. There are huge consequences for Turkey itself, as I say, because you can't be a properly functioning democracy when you're spending all of your time trying to suppress one of the most basic foundational facts about your republic. So um, the importance, the intellectual importance of this event, the intellectual importance of it for history and for our current understanding of things is indisputable. Now, how you get that into the textbooks, I don't know the mechanics of that, uh, but I would say that anybody you know, if, if you're if you're if you're making those decisions based on the importance of the events that you're teaching, then this qualifies very quickly. Um, I see some notes. Um, I know Professor Krez was mentioning how scholar David Moshman said there are four stages of genocide. You may know Gregory Stanton over at the Human Rights Watch. He actually said there he has 10 standards for genocide. And stages or standards? Um, if you wish to call them, well, stages, not standards, unless I, but I do have some other interesting questions here. Hmm. Is one of my history professors said that he preferred to call the Armenian genocide the genocide of Christian minorities because the Armenians were not the only Christian minorities targeted. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, you know, <laughs> there were also Jews in the Ottoman Empire and uh, they were not targeted. It's a, it's a good question why. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not enough of an expert to know. There were certainly, especially in the later stages, the targeting of Greeks and Assyrians as well. But, um, you know, when you look at 1915, the focus was Armenians. Uh, uh, and by the way, you know, it's a very interesting thing because, so you say um, it was targeting the Christians. The Germans were Christian. You know, the very close allies of the Turks <laughs> are Christian. So, uh, it wasn't like it was a campaign against Christianity. On the contrary, Germans very much accepted, right? Um, 
it was the Armenians. Now, I, 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 I think I've given some reasons for especially wanting to target them. I mean, you know, if you look at the Greeks, the Greeks, their homeland is, as it were, quite far away. This is Armenia that we're talking about. This is the Armenian homeland. It had always been. That territory was where all the, you know, when, when you look at the, the New York Times headlines, they talk about Armenia. They don't talk about Armenians in somewhere else. This was Armenia. Now, the, we lost, we lost to the Turks. They subjugated Armenia. They, they made it a, a, a multicultural empire out of it. Uh, and, and, and we had to live with the consequences. But there is a reason why the Armenians were seen as so much more of a threat to the construction of an ethno-national state is because this was really their land. This is historical Armenia. It's not historical Greece. Greece is over there. Okay. I have another question here. I'm a middle school teacher. How would you answer a Turkish student who says it was not a genocide, but it was war and enemies were killed, but it was not a genocide? So mm -hmm. So we're assuming somebody who's between the ages of 12 to 15. One of my favorite uh, questions. Um, um, look, you know, and this is part of the reason why I, um, I wrote that paper, The Concept of Genocide, which we haven't talked about. Um, and, you know, because I, I, I was a member of a group called the, uh, the Workshop on Armenian Turkish Scholarship, WOTS which was a wonderful thing because it brought Turkish and Armenian scholars into the same room once a year to talk about these issues, present papers, try to understand how things were looking from the other person's perspective. And there'd be this endless squabbling about whether this was a genocide or not a genocide, should the, the G word, should it be applied? And I thought, well, look, uh, you know, I'm a philosopher. I know how to read the definition. Let me look at this definition. Uh, of what a genocide is. We, we, we do know roughly what happened, so we can then see whether what happened qualifies as a genocide, given the definition. And, you know, I expected when I looked at the definition of genocide to discover that it was a very stringent concept, that it would take, you know, a huge number of conditions to be satisfied for something to count as genocide. And therefore, there was always a very big question uh, about whether this could or could not count as genocide. And I was very shocked when I actually looked at the, the, you know, the definition of the concept as it appears in the UN Convention on the P Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. That's, that's where the legal concept is defined for the first time. Um, to find that it's actually a very permissive concept. It's a very loose concept. Many, many things qualify as genocide given that concept. I'll give you an example of this. This will probably come as a shock to people who haven't looked at this definition. According to the technical definition, you don't even need a single death for something to count as a genocide. Now, this is really shocking because you know, what the first thing that people think is genocide at least involves mass murder. That's, that's one thing it has to involve. And then there are further questions about whether it's a mass murder of the relevant kind. Was there a genocidal intent? But if you, re if you just look at the definition as a lawyer would, um, as a philosopher might, you'll see that logically speaking, Killing isn't a necessary part. It can be a part, but it isn't a necessary part of something to count as genocide. And if people are interested, we could actually read the definition of. of, of uh, oh, by Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin. Well, Raphael Lemkin is a one. What a what a hero. Um, Raphael Lemkin is the person who first came up with the idea that that there that you needed to introduce a notion of basically something co corresponding to the murder of a people. So genos from Greek for, for people and kider or cider from Latin for, for um, murder. So the murder of a people and, and, and his, you know, the first 
time he became aware of this is from the Armenian case. And he thought, wow, so there, here's this thing, there's this distinctive crime going on and there is no word for it. Winston Churchill uh, said, I think, apropos of the Holocaust, we're here witnessing a crime with no name. So a name was needed and that was what Lemkin worked on. He worked on it for a very long time, starting with the Armenian case and then of course the Jewish case. But the, the, the Lemkin, um, you know, although he did all of this important preparatory work, for it to become a piece of international law, it had to be, it had to have a UN convention. And of course, there you've got endless negotiations between the different powers about what this uh, crime is going to consist in. So if you look, you can only commit genocide against a certain kind of group. For instance, <laughs> uh, so it has to be an ethnic, national, religious uh, group, basically. You can't commit genocide against a political group. So for instance, the Soviet Union was very insistent on this so that Stalin's extermination of the Kulaks would not count as genocide, even though he killed 20 million. If you targeted all homosexuals, it wouldn't count as genocide because that's not the relevant and appropriate kind of group covered by the law. So there are many, there are many aspects of the actual definition that reflect all of these complex negotiations that had to take place at the UN for people to be willing to ratify this convention. Um, one of the aspects is that um, there has to be a genocidal intent, but the intent is to destroy an ethnic, national, or religious group, either in whole or in part. Now, what does in part mean? Um, it doesn't even say in substantial part. It just says in part. Uh, the, if you really distill it down, basically it's harming members of a group with the intention of destroying them in whole or in part just because they are members of that group. Now, if you look at that definition, you know, September 11th counts as genocide. Um, actually, even the kind of revenge targeting of Turks by Armenians in the 1970s counts as genocide because these are part of the, they're part of the Turk ethnic group and they are um, um, targeted because they're Turks and they're being killed or harmed because they're Turks. So that counts uh, in the definition. So the, 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 what I discovered is it's actually quite easy to satisfy the, the, the technical definition. Uh, laid down by the UN. It's not hard. So the answer to the, to the student is, look, uh, all the conditions are satisfied. So in a way, one of the reasons I thought the word genocide, uh, important as it became to the Armenian campaign, uh, was an inadequate vehicle for describing what had happened because what had happened was so much worse than the minimum that would be needed in order to satisfy the conditions and something's counting as a genocide. You'd really have to describe in greater discursive detail uh, what happened because it wouldn't just flow from the definition. Now, I think when people talk about genocide, they actually have an informal meaning in mind. They don't have the technical definition. In mind. The informal meaning that they have in mind is one of the most heinous crimes against humanity that involves mass murder and targeting a group because it is that group. And that's why, uh, because of that informal meaning, it became very important for the Armenians to have an American president classify what happened as a genocide. It only it only makes sense if you're using this informal notion of genocide rather than the technical notion of genocide. Because on the technical notion, that is it's true in spades that, that this was a genocide, but so were many other things. 
So, uh, you know, to the student, you, you'd have to explain some of this to them because uh, there are these two different notions in play and uh, you'd have to distinguish between them. I mean, I think, of course, the events of 1915 count on both readings. It's just that it's often unclear exactly which reading people have in mind. Now, one thing I see I'm getting questions from my, the audience, resources, everything from the movie, you know, Intent to Destroy was about the movie The Promise, obviously. Um, it's been referred to in some circles, I was reading movie critics reviews as sort of the Schindler's List for the Armenian genocide. Um, where, if people want to learn more, because we do, there is a certain amount of inadequacy among history books and texts, where would you advise um, some of our in audience tonight if you want to learn more about the Armenian experience in the Ottoman Empire? So uh, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, I think the documentary is, is a very good source of information um, in, in a very easily accessible form and one that doesn't involve a huge investment of time. Recently, there have been some very, very good books uh, if you want to read a book uh, about the subject. Um, there is uh, the, an excellent book by the British jurist Jeffrey Robertson called An Inconvenient Genocide. Um, there is Ron Sunni's book, uh, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, is the title of that one. Um, and that's a very, very fine piece of very detailed uh, history. Um, there is Peter Balakian's book, The Burning Tigris, which is a very hard read because it's, it's so full of details about the horrible atrocities and suffering. Uh, so there are any number of sources, um, uh, but, you know, and I think the promise, I'm poor, I, I thought the promise, um, didn't fully succeed in being the Schindler's List of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 one, of its, one of its big drawbacks, I think, is that it steers clear of the question why this happened. It just, it's presented as though suddenly the Turks decided that they were going to massacre every Armenian they could lay their hands on. And uh, and that's very unsatisfying. I think if you know, if you really want, that's why the documentary, in a way, is a better source of information because you have a number of historians, theorists, and, and other folks who talk to you about um, part of the, the causal factors that led to this. I have an interesting question here. I was asked if Armenians converted. And I know historically there have been Armenians. I was once told in Istanbul that probably 25% of the population had at least one Armenian ancestor. I have no idea if there's any verification for that. But were they saved if they converted? Yes. So this is a very important point. Um, you know, um, which is part of what shows you that there weren't maybe the same kinds of racial theories underlying the race, the racial hatred uh, as there were in the Jewish case, because in a large number of cases, unfortunately, in the case of girls and young women, uh, if they were willing to convert and, and marry into a Muslim household, they could save themselves. Uh, and in, not so much in the case of men, because there was the fear that the men would um, seek revenge at some point, but, but in the case of a large number of girls and young women, unfortunately, uh, there were abductions, conversions, uh, forced assimilation, and so on and so forth. The estimate is that there are between five to eight million hidden Armenians, they're called in, in Turkey. Um, and there are some very moving anecdotes, stories about, about Turkish children growing up with grandmothers who spoke some funny language that wasn't Turkish and that they couldn't understand until they discovered <laughs> it, was, it was Armenian. And so, you know, you know that's one of the, the horrendous things about these kinds of episodes is of course, if you, if you look at 
you look at Turks and Armenians, you often can't tell which is which. You know, um, it's not as though there is sort of a huge discrepancy in their appearances and so forth. And, and, and as you say, there's probably been a huge kind of intermingling. Um, but um, um, the fact is that the problem isn't so much at the level of the people, but at the level of the government. And the people are only the way they are because they've been brainwashed into this uh, through you know, years and years of uh, miseducation and then intimidation by law. I mean, article, so-called Article 301 of the Turkish Penal Code. I don't know if it's being enforced anymore these days, but for a long time it was in place. And it made it a crime to insult Turkishness. Yeah. And insulting Turkishness consisted in saying anything bad about Turkey and what Turkey had done. So it was a very I'm sure President Erdogan made, likes that law. I do have a question here. Could you please further explain your seeming juxtaposition of Greek territory as their, quote unquote, versus their Armenian historical territory that you call here, quote unquote, how do you differentiate the killings of Greeks in the same period from the Armenian genocide? A brief, saying a brief consultation with Wikipedia, which I have to admit is not the most reliable source in the world, suggests that the killings of the Greek population in the same period are also referred to as genocide. Look, as I say, um, I broke off from Turkey long before that, though. Beg your pardon? I was thinking. Greece had broken off and independent with European support long before that. No, I would be, the, the point I was, the, 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 the oh, oh, that's Kirill Gerstein asking this as a, a friend of mine. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, it's not, the, the, the point wasn't to distinguish between one thing being a genocide and the other thing not being a genocide. Um, and as I say, when you really look, when you understand the definition, targeting any ethnic or religious group um, in whole or in part accounts as a genocide. So it's, it's not a question of that. What I was trying to explain is why the Armenians were so much more the focus of this kind of um, central government obsession with removing them and eliminating them because uh, because the territory on which Turkey was proposing to build the ethno-national state um, was the Armenian homeland, whereas the, the, the traditional Greek homeland uh, is, as it were, in another part of the world. That was the, that was the, uh, the point I was trying to make. But, but absolutely, you know, as I say, if you really understand the, the, the definition, all, all of these killings of Assyrians, of Greeks, and of Armenians, they all equally count as genocide. No, just glancing at the Greek history. Um, certainly, once Greece was officially broken off from the Ottomans in 1829, there, there's a history of internecine warfare between the two nations, which leads still up to today. I mean, we still have the unresolved issue of Cyprus. It was um, largely Greek, but Turkey invaded it. Nobody but Turkey recognizes Cyprus as being a Turkish um, sphere of influence, but it's still there. So certainly there is a hostility between um, Greece and Turkey, um, long standing, more than the better part of what, about 180 odd years worth. But is that a, did they commit a, I mean, killing, yes. And of course, that would qualify under Christian as well. But I'm not sure if it was there a genocide. Well, as I say, you know, this is part of the problem. This is why I wanted to look at this definition. If you look at this definition, it would qualify as a genocide. And uh, yeah. it, 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 so would many other things. Um, the, you then have to start to look at the details. You have to look at the magnitude, the motivation, the the the, uh, the the you know whether whether the people in question had anywhere else to go, um, and so on and so forth. That is you know 
what you find, as you say, Greece was Greece was an independent state. Um, you know, if you do ethnic cleansing in order to get people to move, move from this bit of territory to another bit of territory because that's where they belong in Greece, that's ethnic cleansing, that's genocide under the terms of the definition. Um, it's just that, um, you know, the, the numbers are very different and also the consequences are very different. In the two well, I thought that was a settlement. It wasn't the Treaty of Lausanne back in the 1920s. Didn't that allow a swap of populations? It, um, yes. Muslim Turks who lived in Greek territories got to move to Turkey and Greeks were allowed to move. I mean, that was under Ataturk now, finally, you know, after, after the war. This is the, the, the whole uh, post-war period uh, under Ataturk is a, is a very important uh, period, of course, because Ataturk is the, is the founder of modern Turkey. It's very strange in a way because you know, he himself called the Armenian genocide a shameful act. And uh, the, uh, he, although he was not involved, he was a military commander, um, but he knew all about it. And certainly after the war was over, was involved in the military tribunals that started to prosecute the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide until the 1923, when the Allied powers began to find it much more convenient to work with Ataturk and to put all of this behind them, uh, rather than uh, continue to um, try and investigate and hold accountable the people who, um, who committed this. And back to Germany, what does Germany do? You know, there were the three, the triumvirate, the so-called Young Turks. By the way, this is another bone of contention or rather source of irritation is that this phrase Young Turk is used to signify in the United States a kind of, uh, you know, um, somebody with, uh, uh, with vim and vigor who is uh, prepared to overturn the established order. But it really was the nickname for this triumvirate that perpetrated the Armenian genocide. That's where the origin of the, of the, um, of the, of the term comes from. And there's a TV show called The Young Turks on American cable TV, um, which is such an offensive label. You know, it would be like having, a, I don't know, a, a show called Hitler Youth or something. Uh, and yet, because nobody knows anything about it, people watch it and they think that it's a kind of progressive TV show. I forget the, the, the Turk's name who, who runs it. And although many, and you know, it would have been maybe an innocent mistake had it not been that the person who runs this Young Turk uh, uh, cable show um, wrote several articles denying the Armenian genocide in, in, in the early part of his career. So he, he, he certainly knew what he was doing when he called this uh, show, uh, the Young Turks show. Which, um, which is demonstrating the fact that we still have a great deal of education to do. Well, we're reaching the end of our time. Um, I want to thank our audience for their participation and listening and providing good questions. I'm sure there are many more. But most of all, I want to thank you, Paul. Thank you for this informative 90 minutes of understanding and educating us to a greater detail on the Armenian genocide, which I am calling it that. Thank, thank you. First of all, Leonard, thank you for these wonderful probing questions. Well, you're welcome. To a thing or two. And to Barbara uh, for organizing this event, the center for organizing it, and for all of you for listening in. Thank you very much. And, Hopefully on Saturday, we will hear the declaration. So thank you both yes. uh, for, for your tremendous uh, comments and insights today. I also want to thank our advisory commission member, Margaret Barakiva, for helping to put this together. Uh, and for all of you in the audience for attending. I hope this is the beginning of a conversation for many of us. And I put something in the chat if any of you are educators and you want to compile a list of books about the Armenian genocide for grades four through 12, please uh, write me and uh, you can just use the same email that you use to respond 
to attend this program, and I'd be happy to work with you on that. Save the date, um, May 27th for our next program uh, from 3G New York and 3G New Jersey. Grandchildren carry the legacies of their Holocaust survivor grandparents. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.